I'm Dr. Robert Jones, and this is the uh, introductory lecture for the focused renal exam module. The introductory focused renal ultrasound exam is centered around the detection of hydronephrosis. Acute flank pain is a common clinical presentation in the emergency department. Classic presentation for renal colic includes radiating colicky pain with or without hematuria. Since there are potential mimickers of renal colic, imaging has become an increasingly important tool in the evaluation of the patient with flank pain. The focused renal exam can be used effectively in this clinical setting as a screening tool and ultrasound will not expose the patient to any ionizing radiation, unlike CT renal protocol or IVP. This is important since patients with history of nephrolithiasis will frequently have recurrences and therefore are at risk for uh, exposure to excessive ionizing radiation over the years. The urinary bladder can also be, exam can also be uh, performed to evaluate the patient non-invasively for the evidence of urinary retention. It can also be an extension of the focused renal ultrasound exam since ure ureteral stones are frequently hung up at the distal UVJ they can be detected on the urinary bladder exam. It's important to remember this point early. Hydronephrosis can be caused by either intrinsic or extrinsic compression of the ureter. Therefore, the presence of unilateral hydronephrosis in a patient with flank pain is supportive of the diagnosis of obstructive uropathy due to a clinical or due to a ureteral stone when it fits the clinical history. However, the diagnosis cannot be made with certainty just based on the presence of hydronephrosis. If the ureteral stone is directly visualized, then the diagnosis can be made with certainty. This is important since conditions such as abdominal aortic aneurysms can cause hydronephrosis on the left due to extrinsic compression. Therefore, an elderly patient with left flank pain should not be diagnosed with an obstructive uropathy just based on the presence of unilateral left hydronephrosis. We will discuss this further later in the module when we discuss clinical applications, but it's an important uh, concept to understand early. The kidneys are paired retroperitoneal organs that lie anterior to the psoas muscle. The kidneys are surrounded by a true renal capsule, seen here, perinephric fat, uh, surrounds the kidneys within the perinephric space, and then gerota's fascia is a fibrous sheath that surrounds each kidney, its perinephric fat, and adrenal gland. On this coronal CT image, it can be seen that the right kidney is located more caudal than the left kidney. The kidney is composed of the renal parenchyma and the renal pelvis. The parenchyma contains the renal cortex, which is where the nephrons are located. The parenchyma also contains the medullary pyramids. The pyramids will pass urine into the minor calyces. The renal pelvis contains the collecting system, the renal artery, the renal vein, and the lymphatic vessels. Urine is passed down from the medullary pyramids into the minor calyces, into the major calyces, into the renal pelvis. From there, the urine will travel down the ureters until it reaches the urinary bladder. The, ureter, the, uh, the ureters enter the urinary bladder posteriorly. You can see here it would be the uh, uh, patient's left ureter coming in. Here's the patient's right ureter coming in. When the urine then enters the bladder, it will then exit the bladder through the urethra and subsequently leave the body. This now concludes the introductory video. I'm Dr. Robert Jones, and this lecture, uh, in this lecture, we will cover the. Uh, the focused renal exam of the right kidney. The renal ultrasound exam on the right is as well as on the left is performed with a, a 2 to 5 uh, megahertz curvilinear phased array or phased array transducer. Either type of transducer can be used although the phased array transducer would probably provide superior imaging when scanning intercostally. 
the highest frequency possible should be used when performing the exam. 5 megahertz can be used in thin adults, while 3.5 megahertz can be used in the average sized adult, and 2 megahertz should be used in larger adults. No patient preparation is required for the exam. However, having the patient take in a deep breath during the exam can be helpful since this will move the kidneys more caudal and allow you to scan uh, subcostally. The uh, right kidney is scanned in both the coronal and transverse planes. The exam can be initiated in the supine position and the patient can be t turned into the uh, left lateral decubitus position as needed. The coronal exam is begun with the patient in the supine position. If needed, the patient can be repositioned into the left lateral decubitus position. The transducer is placed just inferior to the right costal margin at approximately the level of the mid-axillary line with the transducer indicator directed in a cephalad direction. If the kidney is not in seen initially, then, gentle, then gently angle the, the transducer in an anterior and posterior direction until the kidney is seen. If the kidney is still not visualized, then have the patient take in a deep breath and hold it. Once the kidney is identified, you're going to want to gently rotate the transducer until the kidney is seen in its coronal plane. So here we have the coronal image of the right kidney. You've got the transducer here, so you're going from lateral to medial, patient's head, patient's foot. You've got the liver here. You've got perinephric fat here. And here is the kidney. You've got the parenchyma. You've got the hypoechoic medullary pyramids. You've got the renal pelvis here. Let's use this coronal CT scan through the right kidney to help better uh, understand the formed ultrasound image. The indicator is directed towards the head. You've got the right or the, the liver here and the right kidney visualized. The coronal scan of the kidney is ideal for assessing the collecting system since you're going to be able to visualize the minor calyces, the major calyces, as well as the pelvis all in one plane and prove that these uh, um, areas all connect with one another. Now, since the goal of this study is to detect hydronephrosis, it's essential to remember that the renal pelvis must be identified when scanning the kidney. If we did a scanning plane that went here in this plane according to uh, letter A, the renal pelvis would be missed even though we would still be able to see the renal parenchyma and therefore it'd be easy to miss hydronephrosis. The same thing would apply to scanning plane C you would get a nice view of the renal parenchyma, but you would not see the pelvis and you would therefore miss the presence of hydronephrosis. Ideally, what you want to do is scan through scanning plane B here, which would take you through the renal pelvis and allow you to diagnose the presence or absence of hydronephrosis. Here is a coronal scan through the right kidney. So your lateral, medial, head and foot, You've got the liver here, you've got the right kidney, you've got the presence of the uh, hypoechoic parenchyma, the hyperechoic pelvis. But in order to verify that you're going through the um, renal pelvis where the collecting system is, you need to sweep the transducer. And so you can see as we sweep through the transducer, or sweep with the transducer here, we get a much better look then at the renal pelvis. And this will help us to minimize missing um, subtle degrees of hydronephrosis. Now to perform the right uh, renal transverse scan, the transducer is going to be ro rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise so that the indicator is pointed uh, posteriorly. The right kidney is going to be imaged through the renal pelvis in the transverse plane. Remember, you have to go through the pelvis. You can't be in the superior pole or inferior pole. You need to go through the pelvis. So this may mean you have to slide the transducer either up or down in order to get that view. Now looking at the transverse scan from a coronal perspective, it can be seen how important it is to scan through the renal pelvis. Notice that if you're in scanning planes A or C, you're not going to pick up any hydronephrosis. You've got to be in scanning plane B in order to uh, you know, detect the presence or absence of hydronephrosis.
Now here is a, a transverse image of the right kidney. The indicator is directed posteriorly. So you can see the liver here. You can see the kidney here in its short axis. You can see the hypoechoic parenchyma and the hyperechoic renal pelvis. Now here we have a transverse sweep through the uh, right kidney. Again, here's liver, hypoechoic parenchyma, hyperechoic renal pelvis. You can see you get a little bit of bowel gas obscuring the kidney here. But notice when we first start off here and we're up by the superior pole, we've got a nice view of the renal uh, parenchyma, but very limited view of the pelvis. So this is not the isolated view you want. You have to make sure you sweep through the entire kidney so you don't miss any uh, you know, more subtle degrees of height. This concludes the right renal focused ultrasound exam. I'm Dr. Robert Jones, and in this lecture, we're going to go over how to perform the focused renal exam of the left kidney. Let's review again the exam essentials. The renal ultrasound exam is performed with a 2 to 5 megahertz curvilinear or phased array transducer. Either type would work, although the phased array transducer would probably provide superior imaging when scanning in between the ribs. You want to make sure you use the highest frequency possible. In a thin adult, that'd be a, approximately 5 megahertz, 3.5 megahertz in the average size adult, and 2 megahertz in larger adults. There is no specific preparation that the patient that is required prior to the exam. However, having the patient uh, take in deep breaths during the exam can be helpful since this will allow uh, the kidneys to move more caudally and allow you to scan in a subcostal uh, window. The left kidney is going to be scanned also in both the coronal and transverse plan, planes, and the exam can be initiated in the supine position, and the patient can be turned into the right lateral decubitus position as needed. Now, the coronal exam of the left kidney is going to be performed with the transducer placed just above the iliac crest in the mid-axillary line with the indicator directed towards the patient's head, and this is going to give you the following image. Here's the transducer here. So you've got cephalad, caudal, lateral, medial. You can see the inferior pole of the spleen here. You can see the hypoechoic renal parenchyma and the hyperechoic renal pelvis. And you can see the echogenic perinephric fat surrounding the kidney. Let's use this coronal CT of the left kidney to better explain the formed ultrasound image. The transducer is going to be placed laterally with the indicator towards the patient's head. By cutting in this coronal plane, we will go obtain coronal slices through the kidney as well as the inferior portion of the spleen. Note that since the spleen is smaller than the liver, it's going to provide a smaller sonographic window and therefore imaging of the left kidney can potentially be more difficult. Also note that you have some potential bowel gas interference here from the uh, descending colon. It's essential to remember, just like with the right kidney, that the renal pelvis has to be identified since a focus goal is the detection of hydronephrosis. Therefore, if you were either in scanning planes A or C, you're going to get a nice view of the parenchyma, but no view of the renal pelvis. You need to make sure that you sweep enough so that you can see that you are indeed visualizing uh, through the renal pelvis. In this coronal sweep of the left kidney, the hypoechoic renal parenchyma and the echogenic renal pelvis are seen. You also are able to visualize the presence of uh, anechoic medullary pyramids. Here you can see several of them right here. Um, note during the sweep that at times the imaging plane is off axis to the renal pelvis. So even though the kidney is still being seen, the renal pelvis is not being visualized and therefore hydronephrosis would be easily missed. So looking here, you've got a nice view of the parenchyma you can see uh, some of the, the medullary pyramids, but this would be a very poor imaging plane for evaluating a patient for the presence or absence of hydronephrosis. 
Using this axial CT cut through the left kidney, portions of the uh, spleen will be seen in addition to um, the left kidney. The indicator is going to be directed anteriorly. If bowel gas was obscuring visualization at the mid-axillary to posterior axillary line, note that the transducer could be moved more posteriorly. This would require repositioning the patient into a right lateral decubitus position. Here would be a transverse image obtained from a more posterior window with the patient in a right lateral decubitus position. Some sonographers will place the patient in a prone position when imaging is compromised in either the supine or right lateral decubitus position. Now using a coronal uh, CT slice through the left kidney, it can be seen that the transducer needs to be placed through the renal pelvis in order to be able to visualize hydronephrosis. So again, scanning planes A and C would provide great visualization of the renal parenchyma, but would not give you any information regarding uh, the presence or absence of hydronephrosis. You would need to have the transducer in scanning plane B. So make sure that you sweep through the kidneys in both uh, planes in order to verify that you've adequately visualized the pelvis. Here's a transverse image of the left kidney. So here you've got um, the hypoechoic parenchyma, the hyperechoic pelvis, you see a portion of the spleen here. Um, the indicator is directed anteriorly. This provides you, uh, in a sense, with a uh, CT scan uh, axial cut through the, uh, this portion of the spleen as well as through the kidney. Notice here we have a transverse sweep through the left kidney. So you can see part of the spleen you can see intermittently that uh, visualization is affected adversely by the presence of these uh, rib shadows. But here you can see the hypoechoic parenchyma, hyperechoic pelvis, and you can see that we've now done a complete sweep through the kidney. This way we would be adequately able to assess for the presence or absence of hydronephrosis, even more subtle degrees. This concludes the left uh, renal performance video. If you have the ability at this time, I would recommend uh, that you go and scan a uh, volunteer. When scanning the volunteer, note the renal pelvis, the medullary pyramids, the renal parenchyma, as well as the perinephric fat in both the sagittal and transverse planes. Scan the patient uh, supine, prone, and in the right lateral decubitus positions. I'm Dr. Robert Jones, and this is the uh, focused renal module, and in this lecture we're going to be covering um, how to perform the urinary bladder evaluation. Let's begin by first performing the sagittal exam of the urinary bladder. Let's take a look first at the sagittal window in a male patient. So you're going to place a transducer with the indicator directed towards the patient's head. The transducer is going to be placed just cephalad to the pubic symphysis, and this will provide you with the following window. Anterior, posterior, head, foot. You're going to have your urinary bladder here. You can see that there are reverberations in the near field. You can see cephalad to the bladder. You're going to have your peritoneal cavity here. Posterior, you're going to have the seminal vesicles, and you're going to have your prostate. Here we have a uh, sagittal view with a CAT scan uh, to help explain the window. Again, indicators pointed towards the patient's head. You can see that you're going to be scanning here. There's a urinary bladder. It's just cephalad to the pubic symphysis. You want to make sure that you stay as close to the pubic symphysis as possible. You want to avoid you know, putting the transducer up high by the umbilicus because unless the patient has over a liter in their bladder, you're not going to see the um, urinary uh, bladder. So make sure that you keep that transducer in a uh, low position in the pelvis, and this will give you the view here of urinary bladder, prostate, seminal vesicles, and then peritoneal cavity in a cephalad direction. Here is a sweep sagittally through the bladder going from side to side. 
Note that there is an excess amount of gain in the far field here, which is due to uh, posterior enhancement, so you'd want to turn the gain down in the far field, but you're still able to get a nice view of the bladder here. Again, there are reverberation artifacts noted in the near field here. Here is a sagittal view of the female pelvis. So again, transducers placed low, just cephalad to the pubic synthesis with the transducer indicator towards the patient's head. This will provide you with anterior, posterior, head, foot. Here's the urinary bladder. You've got some reverberation artifacts in the near field. You've got the uterus posterior. And here you've got the cul-de-sac here posterior to the uterus. Here is a um, sagittal CAT scan cut through the abdomen and pelvis that um, can be used to help explain the formed pelvic image. You can see here indicators towards the patient's head. You've got urinary bladder here. You, uh, you've got the uterus here. And now you've got bowel and the cul-de-sac. And you've got the pubic symphysis here to the uh, caudal direction or to the uh, right of the screen. So here's the ultrasound image anterior, posterior, head, foot, uterus, urinary bladder. If the main goal of the study is to evaluate the urinary bladder, you'd want to make sure that you slide the transducer down a little more caudally so that you can see the full length of the urinary bladder. In this view, it's cut off slightly. Um, now let's take a look at the uh, transverse windows of the urinary bladder. So here's a transverse window here. Indicator is towards the patient's right. So you've got anterior, posterior, patient's right, patient's left, and here you've got a nice view of the urinary bladder. So you'd be able to obtain, obtain AP measurements as well as transverse width measurements, and you can see the bow tie appearance of the seminal vesicles posterior to the urinary bladder. Here we have a transverse view of the female pelvis. Indicator again is towards the patient's right. So you've got anterior, posterior, patient's right, patient's left, there's the bladder. There's reverberation artifact in the near field. You can see the uterus posterior. So you'd be able to again obtain anterior, posterior, as well as transverse width measurements of the urinary bladder. So to measure the urinary bladder volume, you want to make sure that you take three orthogonal measurements. So think about it as having a plus and a minus sign. So here you have a transverse view of the urinary bladder. Here you have a sagittal view. So here I've taken an AP measurement and a transverse width, and here I've taken a caudal cephalad length measurement. What you want to make sure that you don't do is measure the AP plane in both the sagittal and transverse views. That would give you a plus and a uh, you know single vertical line. So remember, it should be a plus and a minus sign when you do these measurements. And you can either take two separate uh, views of the bladder and measure, or you can do a split screen if your machine allows. Here's a split screen of a urinary bladder. You've got the sagittal measurement here. You've got the transverse measurement here. So again, you have the plus sign. And here you have the minus sign. So you've got three orthogonal measurements. And by calculating it out, the bladder volume is roughly in the mid 170s cc's. Here's an example here of urinary jets. Here's a sagittal view. Here's a transverse view. Remember that the ureters come into the bladder posteriorly. Now normally we use Doppler to visualize the urinary jets, but it's not uncommon to see them on just the grayscale imaging. So don't be surprised when you're scanning the bladder to see this. This is just the urine entering the bladder from the ureters posteriorly. So in order to get a uh, urinary jet view in the transverse plane, you're going to want to make sure that you've got the transducer over the uh, trigone posteriorly where the ureters enter into the bladder. That would give you this view, anterior, posterior, patient right, patient left, and then you'd be able to see here where the urinary jets or the urine is entering within the bladder. 
remember, depending on the degree of hydration and the presence or absence of obstruction, it could take, you know, several minutes in between each urinary jet. Here is a, a sagittal view, anterior, posterior, head and foot. You're in somewhat of an oblique plane here so that you're able to uh, see the distal ureter as well as its entry point into the bladder. What you see here is that the patient has some degree of distension of the distal ureter and that's because there's a stone right at that trigone where the ureter enters into the bladder. So this is a common area for stones to get hung up. So this is why it's important to take a look at the bladder, whether you're doing bladder volume measurements or whether you're scanning for hydronephrosis. Because if you're able to see the stone definitively, and frequently these stones are very distal, then that would allow you to definitively make the diagnosis and frequently then um, obviate the need to get a CAT scan or other imaging. Here's an example of a transverse view of the bladder, anterior, posterior, patient's right, patient's left, and using Doppler, we're able to see both urinary jets on the right as well as on the left. Remember, this is just a global qualitative assessment. It's not quantitative, um, and you're not using this to you know, necessarily determine minor degrees of variance since that may occur in normal patients anyway. Um, if you see the complete absence of a urinary jet, that would go along with a complete obstruction. However, a partial obstruction would still allow urine to pass into the bladder, so you have to be careful about how you interpret the presence or absence of these urine jets. This concludes the performing the, ur performing the urinary bladder examination.